with all not your truth or kindness, Lord. With all not your truth or kindness, Lord. Welcome to The Notice, where together we notice the mercy of God. I'm Susan Hoopstra, your host. The Notice podcast explores our need to be noticed through biblical musings and conversations with special guests, experience relevant topics and encouragement as we take notice of how the God of mercy satisfies. On this episode of The Notice, do you believe that Jesus offers us peace, joy, and rest, but struggle to experience those promises? Is it that God isn't noticing us, or do we find it challenging to trust Him? Join me as I welcome Bible teacher, author, and podcaster Angie Bauman. We talk about our struggles to trust God, discover new ways to surrender, and how trusting and noticing can go hand in hand. Well, Angie, Bauman founded Steady On Ministries to encourage Jesus followers to keep moving forward in their Christian growth. She is a Bible teacher, author, and host of the podcast Stronger Together. Her most recent Bible study, Strong Hearts, increasing our trust in Jesus through examining the lines of the Lord's Prayer, just released, and she recently was host of an online Say Yes to God's Abundance virtual retreat. But I loved how Angie described herself on this website. She said, Angie loves Jesus. Her core desire is to live in fellowship with him. Angie loves her family. Her husband, Matt, and her two boys, Alex and Josh, are the people she gets to do life with. Married for 22 years, Matt and Angie have made their home in Southern Illinois, where Matt contributes his administrative gifts at Southern Illinois University. The boys keep them on their toes by participating in music, church, social, and sports activities. And Angie loves teaching. Nothing fills her up like leading a Bible study or sharing a message to a group that is heart ready to hear it. I can relate to that one, Angie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Angie loves a local church. She grew up a preacher's kid and jumped into ministry as early as her teenage years. She served as a pastor since 2004 and has been involved with the start or restart of worship services. Angie also loves trekking trips to Walt Disney World, sipping cups of hot tea, watching old Law and Order episodes, and almost anything with the Paisley print. So Angie, welcome to The Notice. Susan, thank you so much for having me today. I just loved how you described that, especially the first thing you said. You said, Angie loves Jesus. I'm like, I do. cool. I like this girl already. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was really, really cool. And I just really liked how you told us a little bit more about who you are. And it sounds like you've had a lot of different experiences. But as I get to know more writers, I realize that most people write about something they experience or have struggled with themselves. And so this new book that you wrote is about trust. So is it safe to say that maybe you struggle with trusting God yourself? Absolutely. I think it's safe to say that I have struggled with it and that I do struggle with it. Probably also that I will continue to struggle with it. You know, I have known Jesus my whole life. I actually do not have a memory of not being aware of God's presence in my life, but life is hard, is it not? And um, I have in my past, I have childhood abuse and trauma I suffered a miscarriage. I've been involved in a head-on car crash. I've had some health problems. Like everyone listening, we experience dark seasons, do we not? And times when the path gets a little bit harder to walk, right? And I think when we when we deal with those kinds of things that come into our life, even as believers, even as people who take our faith walk, our faith journey seriously, it can really raise questions and we can ask, you know what, Lord, if you want what's best for my life. And if your word says you're going to take care of me and this is my reality, I don't know how those things share space, Mm -hmm. right? I don't know if I can count on you, if I can believe you, if I can trust you, because I don't like where I am at all. And it kind of raises the question in my heart, 
are you trustworthy? Do you see me? If I can use your word, do you notice me, Lord? Because I'm really struggling right now. And what happens with those circumstances? Because you labeled a lot of different circumstances. And I'm sorry to hear about some of the things that have happened in your life. But how do circumstances line up with us not trusting God? I think we get ahead of ourselves in that we have expectations for how God is going to take care of us, mm-hmm. if you will, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So if, if I love you and I believe you love me, then you will keep me comfortable. And when that doesn't happen, and, it, and for all of us, it doesn't happen at different times. And when that doesn't happen, we ask the question, was I wrong to put my trust in you? Or are you really trustworthy? Or if this is where I have found myself, given the circumstances in my life, then what does it mean about my ability to depend on you? And we confuse what we want with what we need. And then we doubt that he's taking care of our needs because what he's really not taking care of, if you will, is our wants. Because we want to be comfortable. We want to not hurt. We want to not be in pain. And that's not always the story that, that our life unfolds. I love that. That's good. I saw this quote that Roy T. Bennett said. He said, consistency is the true foundation of trust. Either keep your promises or do not make them. Now, I'm sure he's referring to human trust, trust Mm -hmm. between relationships with people. But that's one of the problems we have, isn't it? As we we think we should trust God in the same way we trust other people. So I'd love to get your feedback on that quote. Well, I think very much that God is in the business of keeping his promises, if you will. I I believe that (laughs) with all my heart. I really do. But there are things we need to know about God in order to be able to receive those promises. And I think for me, one of the stumbling blocks that I have seen in my own walk and that I see in other people's walk is, do we really know what he's promising us? What is God's Mm -hmm. promise to Mm -hmm. us? Do we, do we know it? And do we meditate on it? Do we contemplate it? And do we hold that tightly, if you will? Um, And if we do know the promises of God, then how do we see those promises in our lives being fulfilled? God promises us, uh, promises us a lot of things in his word. I believe that is true, but ultimately, they, this is my hypothesis, and I encourage your listeners to test me and see if they think that I'm right, but mm-hmm. ultimately, the promises go back to two things. I love you. I will not leave you. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, that's mm-hmm. what God promises mm-hmm. us. Good. And as I've said, you know, I've been through some difficult things in my life. I'm confident you have. I know your listeners have been through difficult things in, in our lives. But when we can evaluate those, can we look and see that God's promises held strong, that he loves us and that didn't change and that he was with us and that didn't change. I have, when I teach Bible studies, one of the things that I really encourage people on is making a plan for when you can feel your emotions struggling, if you will, right? Like Mm -hmm, I'm in this mm -hmm. situation in my life and I'm feeling like God doesn't notice me, isn't with me. And so if I believe that's not true, if I believe his promises that he loves me and he stays with me, then what's my plan to getting back to that connection with him? And one of the things I think is so effective is to really Make, if you will, a mental list or for our journal, journaling friends, uh, an actual list. What are ways that when we've been through something in our life before that we can see now, maybe we couldn't see it then, right? But we can see God's faithfulness then. Because when we can recall how God has been faithful mm-hmm. to us in yeah, other good. times in our mm-hmm. life, we can hang on to that in the time that we're struggling to remember that he's with us now. Because I'm, I'm so easily emotionally swayed. I don't know about you, but my emotions can really get the better of me sometimes. And I can get down or I can feel not seen. I can feel like God is, you know, has walked away from a circumstance, but I've been doing this long enough now that I know that is not true. And how do I know it? Because I can remember he's never done that to you before. It has felt like this before, but you know now of God's faithfulness in that time. So, so what is our plan to remember he is trustworthy when we're struggling to feel like he is. And I think you're talking a little bit about our expectations, aren't you? I mean, what do we expect God to do? And I love that you said you expect God to love you Mm -hmm. and you expect God to be there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I think yeah. what we do is put, we add to that list, don't we? Yes. We add a list of, well, God, if you love me and then. that, and you're here, then why don't you do it this way? Right. And instead of, it's almost like we're defining what good is. Yes. Where God's good is different. He has a different thought and agenda about that. And I think if we want to be mature believers, we have to be willing to ask ourselves the hard question when we feel that way. Did he let us down or did I not get what I wanted? Because mm. those things are very different. Sometimes we are not going to get what we want. Sometimes people are not going to take good care of us. They're going to be mean to us. They're going to abuse us. Sometimes relationships are going to dissolve. People are going to die. We are going to struggle and hurt. That is the reality. But in that situation, did God really not keep his promise or is he loving us and staying right with us while we go through that, whatever we're going through? And another part of that is we have to honor his divine establishment principle of free will. Other people have free yes. will. They can make decisions that cause that pain Absolutely. or whatever in our life. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that came directly from God. It was uh, you, I guess we can get into God allowing, which is what you do later in the book, and we'll talk about that. But you know what's interesting is I think, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency, there are some moments and times and seasons in my life where I'm, I'm trusting God. It's good. Albert, it's good. And then all of a sudden, I realize I start not trusting him, and I'm inconsistent. I'm writing this book called A Firm Grasp, coming out in the spring. It's, there's a chapter in it that I write. It's called Give and Take. And it talks about the surrender and how like, we give something to God and we're trusting him for it. Then we take it back. And it, it reminds me that not one of us fully trusts God every single moment. Mm -mm. We don't. So why do you think it's so hard to trust? I think there are two things, at least this, this is my experience anyway. There are two places where sometimes trust is a struggle. One is like what we've been talking about before when we're going through something kind of dark and difficult and painful. And it's hard to remember sometimes that God is right with us in that struggle. But another time when we struggle to trust is when things like you said are kind of going all right and we've got this. I don't need you to help me figure this mm -hmm. out right now because I have this. Mm -hmm. I can do this in my own resources. And I kind of like the direction this is going and I kind of don't want you to tell me it's not the right direction. So I'm just gonna hang on to what's happening and keep moving forward. Because I think ultimately, I'd be interested in your thought on this, but ultimately I think we crave certainty and control. And when we're leaning into the spirit, really listening for how he wants to guide our daily lives, there's this act of surrender that happens that often doesn't seem smart or safe. And the enemy will be all up in that and tell us it's not safe. You've got this sweetheart. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to be asking him for what you need to be doing next or anything. But God is really teaching me something right, right now in my life about the difference between holding tightly and holding loosely and how so often I'm holding tightly to things that I think I can control when really the only thing I need to be holding tightly to is him because he is the one that is going to ordain, if you will, the steps that I take one by one. And my tendency is I want you to just, God, just show me where we're going and I'll get us there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but he's yeah. like, no, no, what I really want to do is I want to show you the next step and then we'll just stay right there while we learn something. And then I'll show you the next step and then I'll show you. But that's a lot of times our trust is really about that's too slow for us, right? And mm -hmm. I don't know for sure that you're going to take me to where I want to be going. Right. You know, I, I love that you said it involves certainty and control, but you also mentioned earlier the word comfort. Mm -hmm. So it's like all three, there's the three C's. There even. you go. <laughs> <laughs> three C's, certainty, control, and comfort. Funny because I think a lot of times we take control because we like to feel good about ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. And when we're doing something productive or like, like even like you do a project and you get done and you, you know, there's that feeling of, oh, I, I did it, you know? And that we want to feel good about ourselves. And I don't think God doesn't want that to happen at mm -hmm. all. I think he wants us to feel good about ourselves. But we take, I think it gets into control, don't you think? When we, when we say, I, because I was successful at that, therefore I can control this part of my life too. Yes. 
Does that make sense? A- absolutely. I, if I can share, God, God taught me so much about control and expectations after I mentioned just a minute ago, we were, I, my family of four was involved in a head-on car crash in 2010 and I was in rehab for about nine months. My baby was only seven months old. He had to go live with my mom my, my, because we couldn't take care of him. We had three full-time caregivers in the house. We had multiple surgeries. It was a very difficult wow. time. Wow. I did not take care of myself, my home, my children, but it was in that place. And I talk about this in the book, but it was in that place that God really began to get a hold of my heart because one of the things I was so disappointed with him, Susan, I was mm. just, how did this happen? And like you said, it was someone, someone was uh, drinking. They fell asleep at the wheel, crossed the center line. It was just it's someone's actions. And here's where we found ourselves. Right. And I was really struggling with this God that I had loved and served and I didn't understand. And I, my, my mind craved understanding. It called out to understanding. And it was in that place where I began to learn some things that have, they can, I'm still learning them, but they continue to serve me well about control. This, this idea that actually we control nothing. Every breath we take can mean our lives become something very different than what we're accustomed to. And is God still good when I can't move from bed to chair, when I don't go to the bathroom on my own, when I don't brush my own teeth, when I don't take care of my own children, is God as still, still as good in that place, breathing that life as he was before that happened to me. And God really talked to me a lot about how in a place of not being able to take care of my physical needs, I could actually really experience him touching and speaking Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. what was, what really mattered was my emotional needs. Because as long as I could be in control of my life, if you will, I could push some of the things that I hadn't dealt with in my life. But because I was in that place of brokenness, of disappointment, I was much more willing to listen to him talk to me about things that were more important. What's funny about that, or ironic, I should say, is that as you were going through with it, you were struggling, obviously, you were struggling for control and certainty and comfort, right? But now as you look back on that, Angie, don't you see that that was good? What God all was over doing it. was good. I see God's goodness all over it. And here's the thing, in the early days after that, my mantra, if you should, if you would, was sort of, I, I just would say over and over again, I just want my life back. I just want my life back. I just want my life back. And God began to open my heart to the understanding that my life was not coming back, but that he had a different path for me that would actually be eventually, not right away, I will say, um, but would eventually be so much richer so much sweeter, so much more peace, uh, having gone through that experience than having not. And so even though in the early days, all I wanted was my life back and I wished that it hadn't happened with my entire being. Right. Mm-hmm. And I know some of your listeners would say, oh yeah, I know what that experience is. Especially in my life. now with right. COVID. <laughs> yes. Yes. I just wished it hadn't happened. But 11 years later, for sure, it's one of this, it's one of God's greatest gifts to me because it helped me embrace him at a deeper level that has really changed everything in my heart. And one of the things I I started to learn is that God gets to decide what good is. And I have to trust that he knows better for me than I know for myself. Right. Um, and, mm-hmm. and these circumstances that aren't ours, that, that they are worldly circumstances, because as tried as it sounds, we live in a fallen world. We, do. we are going to deal with disappointment. But what he can do in that, he promises, again, to love us and never leave us. And the Bible says, I will not leave nor forsake you. And just, just in the last little bit, one of the things that God's really opened my heart to is the difference between leaving and forsaking, because leave is... Like physically, when you think of somebody leaving, they're not in your presence, right? They're just not yeah. around. But the idea of forsaking is like an emotional, an emotional separation. It's like a betrayal. Almost, yes, yeah. exactly. And a lot of times, probably in relationships, you might relate to this, that people leave before they leave emotionally they're distant before physically they're distant. Right. But God is promising, I I won't do either thing. I'm not going to leave your presence 
And I'm also not going to leave you where you are. I'm not going to say, oh, you're, you're too much of a mess for me today or this situation. I'm tired of talking to you about this or you know, anything like that. This is always the place, God's presence, the, always the place that we will continue to work on. We will continue to talk about wherever it is you are and whatever it is we need to. And that's the essence of God, his omnipresence. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 I think I spoke about this recently in a podcast that there's a difference between his omnipresence and his manifestation. I mean, there are certain days where I sense and experience and his presence in a big, 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 mighty way. Sure. Um, uh, that happened to me last Saturday. It was just a whole string of little events, but they were all God moments. And I was just like overwhelmed. And I was like, I know you see me, you're here. Thank you for noticing me. And the thing is, is that we, we expect that to happen every day. It gets back to expectations, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Is God good? Is he going to sh- manifest himself to me every day? And the answer is he may, and he may not but he's always present with us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's not a human quality because we can't be present with people all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. So we we're trying to, aren't we trying to attribute a human quality to God? I think often we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that gets us into trouble. You know, I want to take a a different direction here because there's something you said in the book that I want to get to that really spoke to me because of the theme of this podcast. And, and you said, I sought to fill the hole in my heart by receiving affirmation from God and others. But of course, even when I received affirmation, the hole could never be filled that way. So my heart remained weak and empty. So Angie, why do you think the affirmation of others left you empty? It's a matter of trusting that others see the real you? For me, this I'll speak only for myself because this is my experience. I have tried to affirm, feel affirmation from the world. And I still struggle with that very much. But for me, affirmation from the world is like pouring water into a measuring cup with holes in the bottom. Mm. It, it, you, can, you can pour a swimming pool of water through that measuring cup and you can have all the affirmation. It, it can be overflowing, except it'll never be full. You'll never right. hold on to it. Now, maybe some people can. I don't know. I would suggest they can't, but I cannot. I cannot feel affirmed through the affirmation of the world. And so in my younger years, I just continued to, well, if I just get more, if I just have more affirmation, right? If I just have more praise, if more people like me, whatever, if people like me more uh, than than not, if you will. And that was something that I really chased. Um, But for me, I have learned that only understanding and sitting in God's affirmation, and that doesn't mean he doesn't ever correct me, but hearing the voice of God that is always loving and invitational, because even in his correction, it is invitational. It is gentle. It, uh, it provides parental support kind of, uh, you know, correction, if you will. And it's not condemning and it's not shaming, but it is, um, it is the kind of affirmation that I can trust And when I feel myself slipping into a place where I'm craving or chasing the affirmation of the world, I can recognize that feeling and know this isn't even what's going to help you and go back to the place, the source, spend time with the one whose affirmation is the only one I'm ever actually going to feel and be able to claim. And I love that. And I also love the fact that, look, isn't the fact that God says he's never going to leave us or forsake us, isn't that affirming? Yes. Because he's saying, it doesn't matter, Angie, yeah. what you've done, what you've gone through, mm-hmm. what, how you responded to this or what you, how you reacted to this, that, or the other thing, or the circumstances in your life. He says, I love you. You're worth it. You're worth yeah. it. And we struggle because we're trying to, this push to feel worthy. Mm-hmm. And God says, look, no, it, it you're, let's face it, you're not worthy. I mean, you're a sinner and you miss the mark, you make mistakes, you have limits, but the cross says that you're worth it. And it's like, that's so affirming. And when we know God is affirming him, does that help us build trust in him? It can when we receive it. I think we will, we will trust God 
to the degree that we will receive his affirmation. So if we continue to go through our lives, not spend time with him, not study him, not praise him, not look for things, even on a day like you were talking about, where maybe God isn't as apparent to us as he is some other days, will we, will we humble ourselves and remind ourselves of his faithfulness and find ways to praise him and find ways to connect with him? Will we believe him when he says he loves us? Will we find evidence of that in our lives? And will we kind of dig deep, if you will, and receive that affirmation? Or will we continue to walk on and sort of what I call hold our hand up to his promises and say, I don't think so. And I think most of us wouldn't say we do that on purpose, say we don't want to receive his promises, but it does take a heart posture of humility and recognizing what God is doing for us and allowing him to speak truth over our lives about what he's trying to do in and through us. And I love that you talked about being in a position to receive, because a lot of times we just have to be more aware of areas that we don't trust. You know, in your book, Strong Hearts, Increasing Our Trust in Jesus Through Examining the Lines of the Lord Prayer, you, you, you come across six different questions, and I want to share them with our listeners, because I think they're they're, they give us that self-awareness. They give us that, put us in a position to receive. Does God love me like a good parent? Another one is God's will must. Will following God's plan satisfy? Is God faithful to forgive? Can God help me in temptation? And I think my favorite in a lot of what we've been talking about today is, is God really in charge? So all these questions, and these are great, powerful questions to help us be more self-aware, to get us in a position to receive, right? But which one of these questions was especially hard for you? I think the forgiveness chapter was probably the hardest to write. Not, it wasn't the hardest to get words on the paper to write, but it was the one that I still... I can feel the emotion in my voice, even as I'm trying to say it, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it is the one that I still, as I read it, shed tears because it is a work in progress for me, which I say often through the book, I, I it, forgiveness is a central issue in my life, how other people's unforgiveness has affected my relationship with them, central relationships in my life, how my unforgiveness of myself has been such a central issue how my unforgiveness of others and really just understanding, still asking the Lord to help me understand how forgiveness in this world is so connected to how much I can receive and know and feel just like we were saying about that feeling, his affirmation of us. But part of it is when I have, it's like I have this um, something between me and him when I carry around unforgiveness or when I am trying to be in relationship with someone and they're carrying around unforgiveness. And so it's like between us and people. So you have to forgive their unforgiveness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And from yeah. in my life, it's been complicated, Susan. And so forgiveness is an issue that he still really is opening my heart to, teaching me about the importance of it. You know, we, talk, we say it in church, you know, we're forgiven, so we should forgive. But let's face it, some of us have some really tricky situations in our lives and really understanding what it means to forgive is, it, is isn't, hard. Yeah, go isn't ahead. The rea isn't the reality that we really don't have the capacity to forgive in our humanity? We really need, when we accept the forgiveness of Christ, God gives us the power through the Holy Spirit to forgive ourselves and others because on our own, I can't forgive. I mean, I have a list. I have my list of things that have happened in my life too. And those are areas too, where we have to kind of ponder, okay, it's like an onion and layer and layer yes. and layer of forgiveness. And it, it continues on and on. You know, I love in your book though, that you use the Lord's prayer to help us answer some of those questions. Can you tell our listeners about how you incorporated the Lord's prayer in this study? Thank you. Yeah, I think for me, more than answering the question, when I looked at the Lord's Prayer, 
I began to say, what is it that I'm saying here? You, you mentioned earlier this idea of self-awareness. How, how am I just rattling off these familiar lines? At least they've been familiar to me all my life. I have no memory of not knowing the, the words of the Lord's Prayer. Where does this help me see the places that I need to confess my preconceived ideas about how I want God to take care of me? And be able to share my disappointment even with him sometimes in the way that I feel like he's not taking care of me and Mm -hmm. listen to him talk to me about, well, this is what I'm actually doing in your life and in your heart. We talk about, you know, pray, we pray to God, give us this, give us this day, our daily bread, but I want this kind of bread right? Mm -hmm, I want it mm -hmm, to look this mm -hmm. way, right? Um, We pray your will be done, but I want that to mean your will is this. But will we just leave the prayer there? Give us this day our daily bread. And I trust that you will. Mm. Period. Are we able to leave it there? And so, and so looking at the Lord's prayer for me, it began to sort of poke at the places where I said it with an asterisk and then put the little request at the bottom by the asterisk, but this is what I mean. Right. 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 Yeah. Did you get that God? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, You know, I love this book. I love what you're doing um, in encouraging people. And, and also I think a lot of us come to a place where we, we do write a book because we're, we, we struggle in that area. And I love your, your ministry is called steady on ministries. You also offer step-by-step workshops you have an online Bible study and a virtual book club, which I think is cool. And just recently you hosted an online free virtual retreat called Say Yes to God's Abundance. That must have been really fun. Can you give us some, some examples of some of the things that the speaker said during that? Yes, absolutely. Say Yes to God's Abundance is the sort of the the answer to the trust questions almost, if you will. And what, what the ladies that presented we all talked about just some of the trust issues in our life and what kept us from receiving God's abundance, if you Mm. will, and how some people Mm. overcame that. So for instance, Tiffany Jo Baker did a session on uh, say yes to giving. She talked about her journey as a surrogate and how um, as a surrogate mom, she's had three, three times she's been a surrogate mom and what that process was like, because when we say yes to a call from God, it gets hard sometimes, but right. right? But the, but the idea of giving and saying yes to God has brought so much blessing from the Lord into her life. And it's just deepened her relationship with him. Bethany Turner, who is a Christian fiction author, did a session on say yes to change. She left her job as a vice president in banking to answer a call to write and to serve in ministry and what it was like to kind of let go of that certainty and trust Mm -hmm. God in that Mm -hmm. calling. Carmen Galliano talks about say yes to forgiveness. She was abused by a youth pastor, but continues on in ministry in the same church where that happened. Mm -hmm. And she talked about what it, what it meant to, to be able to separate some of the circumstances in that church from the ministry that she was called to in that church and dealing with that. Uh, so yeah, we have, we have a uh, six different, we had six different sessions and it was really all about ways that people were honest about their struggles, but how leaning into God in those struggles, if you will, uh, provided growth and opportunity to walk in a place of peace and rest. So not that we, not that we've arrived or that they've arrived, but they are, they're growing because of their yes. Exactly. Great stuff. And I just love that you're encouraging people to say yes to trust, say yes to trust. If I'm going to say yes to the dress, let's say yes to trust. Exactly. And being willing to sit in the place that's uncomfortable for a while and not saying, well, I did this wrong, you know, because when, Mm -hmm. when you say yes, a lot of times what happens is then something doesn't go as we expected. We heard some, we heard God's invitation, whether it's to step out and do a ministry or to, you know, to participate in a Bible study or, you know, who, who knows, whatever God is kind of leading us to. Um, And we say, we step out, we say yes, maybe. And then we meet some kind of obstacle and we shrink back and think, oh, I can't do this. And we limit what God is trying to do through Mm -hmm. us. But if we will stay and and hold tight to God in that uncomfortable, right. Right. then he can teach us something that we didn't know and, before. And not focus on our inadequacies and all those things like so Moses easy to do and though. Gideon yeah. and all those folks, our, yeah. our Old Testament friends did. So friends if out there, 
If you're listening, you can go to Angie's website, Live Steady On. You can catch her book. Things that she puts on her website, which I'm going to close with, is Psalms 40, 1 through 3. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. So friends, if you struggle to have trust, know you're not alone, but our God is worthy of our trust. So take notice. Take notice of the simple everyday ways he's part of your life and his grace and his goodness. We know he's got great things planned. the host. Today's question comes from Joan who asks, what are the best ways we can validate others? Well, I can't offer that explanation without defining exactly what validation means. On the notice and in the upcoming book, A Firm Grasp, our definition of validation is simple. Acknowledgement of someone's essence, perspective, or experience. Validation is crucial, and God's establishment of free will supports validation as a fundamental human right. We all have a right to our space, our perspective, and the opportunity to express it. It's a basic human need to have someone acknowledge us, to acknowledge our very presence. So generally speaking, this means the best way to validate someone is to actually acknowledge that they exist. Notice them. Too often, when someone is offering us their experience, we determine that we must agree with them in order to validate or notice them. The best way to acknowledge someone, though, is to listen and allow them the chance to express themselves. After they're done, it's good to reflect or reiterate what they said so they feel acknowledged. Then, if you do have a different viewpoint to offer, ask permission to offer your perspective. This goes a long way to validating someone. I'm not 100% at all this, but I've really seen some effective conversations come out of validating others. So do you have a question for the host? Visit my website at susankhoekster.com and send in your question. You can listen in for other episodes to hear your question answered. Until next time, take notice. Oh